with the coccid, you see, sometimes most of the laying ants during our frost study, they completely cease to stop laying eggs. So that's a huge problem, even like with the hundreds of thousands of bird in, a, in the cage, and then that the coccid is transmit so fastly, so quickly. But even if we can reduce the lesion and then reduce the oocyst from the coccidiosis, that will maybe help us like save other bird to get the disease as well. And then also we can increase the egg production, reduce the feed conversion ratio based on our study. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm your host today, Kelly Wamsley, and I'm joined by Dr. Milan Sharma. Hey, Milan. Hi, Dr. Wamsley. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Uh, it's fun because it's a familiar face uh, with me and you, I guess, right? <laughs> it's been a while. I've not been in, at the Mississippi State University, and then it's already been five years since I graduated from there, so... Time flies. You're making me feel old now. So let's just, I guess, so um, dive into it. So obviously, we've already covered your school background, so UGA, and um, with your PhD. But before that, you went to Mississippi State Poultry Science, um, and you worked with uh, Dr. Pratima Matakari. And then in your PhD, you worked with Dr. Wu Kim, right, at UGA. Yes. Okay, so we're going to talk. So you worked with layers whenever you were here at Mississippi State, and then you kind of continued that on at UGA, right? Um, and so you want to talk a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing there, that you had done there for your uh, PhD work. Uh, during my PhD work, I worked mostly with the laying hands, starting from bullet to the adult like at the peak production and then most of those research was focused on a disease challenge model especially with the coccidiosis uh the reason why we chose coccidiosis in bullets and laying ants was because the united states egg industry is trying to move from case to the case free industry so we thought when we move to the case free of prevent system in future then uh there might be like a lot of incidences of coccidiosis and then we have already seen a lot of those cases already so that's why we focus on coccidiosis. At Barnes, we're more than just another feed additive company. We are driven by science, innovation, and an understanding of the challenges you face in the ever-changing world of animal agriculture. We are your trusted partner for new-to-market natural alternative to choline chloride, colon plus FC, as well as enzymes, prebiotics, probiotics, macro minerals. To learn more about our product offering, visit barnes-ne.com forward slash animal nutrition. Together, there's always a better solution. Okay, yeah, so we're taking the birds out of the cages, putting them back on the floor, and so you're getting some of the problems that we are seeing in broilers or have, have been seeing in broilers. And so trying. So then are we looking at some of the same solutions or some of the same, um, uh, you know, trying to solve the, those problems in the same way with broilers or what, what's the approach there? Uh, most of the things we did was trying to find something that has already been done in the broiler and then try to see if that work in the laying ends. And then since their physiology is kind of similar, the only thing like we raise the broiler for the meat production and then laying ends for the egg production. So there might be a little bit different how they react to each of the treatment and then how they react to the disease. But in the end, we are trying to find the solutions from the broiler and then try to use it in the layers and then try to see if they work properly or did we need to make some changes over there or not. So you worked with um, arginine and some vitamin D3, vitamin E, right? Tell us a little bit about that work. We did like multiple trial at the same time using vitamin D3, vitamin E, l arginine and some of the phytogenic feed additive as well. And then the most promising result we see in terms of improving the egg production was with L-arginine and vitamin D3 and vitamin E uh, in the disease model compared to the challenge control, which we are de definitely challenged with coccidiosis. Uh, interestingly, we see L-arginine and vitamin E has better in terms of the uh, egg production, uh, whereas L-arginine and vitamin D3 were able to reduce like more of the improve more of a gut health parameters like lesion score of the coccidiosis, uh, more of the oxidative stress. 
What's the kind of a or the range in production um, age of the bird that you're kind of seeing this and that you were testing it in? And was there a difference in what you found to be effective dependent upon um, that age of production? Uh, we tried those uh, nutritional intervention in the pea cake production. Uh, from our previous uh, study, when we challenged the laying in at peak production with coccidiosis, the egg production significantly dropped for at least two weeks. And then depending on the doses of the coccidiosis with the low dose or high dose, and then the level of egg production significantly reduced, and then they went below 10% when we induced with the high doses of the coccidiosis. And for our next study with the nutritional intervention, we use 150% of the l arginine requirement. And in that case, the challenge control was below uh, 20%, but below 20%. And then when we supplemented the l arginine uh, I think the egg production improved by at least 15%. So I guess with an increase in production like that, I mean, obviously when you've got necrotic enteritis and coccidiosis going on, then then that's going to you know cost you extra money because you've got to have a loss in production. And so um, trying to prevent those things would be an increase in cost. Um, but if you are able to also see an increase in production um, beyond what the bird would normally have, then it's cost effective? Mm, I think so. With the coccidiosis, sometimes most of the laying ins during our first study, they completely cease to stop laying eggs. So that's a huge problem, even like with the hundreds of thousands of bird in, a, in the cage, and then that the coccidiosis transmits so fastly, so quickly. But even if we can reduce the lesion and then reduce the oocyst from the coccidiosis, that will maybe help us like save other birds to get the disease as well. And then also we can increase the egg production, reduce the feed conversion ratio based on our study. So do you have, I guess, what do you think on, um, is, is there more to go in that area or um, what, what, what's kind of the next projects that you're working on? Um, I think there might be, again, like it's only like 12% to 15% increase in the egg production. But with the adjustment that we can do, again, with most of the other amino acid. And then the interesting thing is like we did a metabolomic analysis of those hens from our fossil and then we see a lot of changes in the uh, level of the amino acid that we found in the plasma and then during the peak period and then during the recovery period. So that means like 60 PR days post inoculation or post challenge and then 14 days post challenge. So during the peak production, the, the amino acid level in the blood plasma increase significantly. Uh, that might be because of the, all this. Um, during the coccidiosis, we see a lot of uh, intestinal villi turnover, so that might increase the level. But during the recovery period, all of those uh, amino acid levels drop down significantly below uh, the control, uh, the non challenge bar. So we think we can still like use a lot of different combination of the amino acid and then maybe try to, maybe we can improve the egg production even more. Kemen calls all poultry experts. You already know the key to a profitable operation is healthy, productive birds. Our team of poultry experts are driven by curiosity to develop science-backed ingredients and solutions that help you maintain feed and water quality, improve intestinal health, optimize nutrition, and eliminate pathogens. Learn more today by diving in at kemen.com forward slash poultry to learn more. So what about the the content, uh, the nutritional content of the eggs? And if you're providing these kind of, you know, um, fat soluble vitamins and uh, other nutrients, then are you changing the composition of the egg and making it more nutritious? Uh, there has been like some research where if you fed the hens with more of a vitamin D3, vitamin E, or those other nutritional compounds, then there is a chance that it will also go because of the fat solubility, it can go into the yolk and then it might again enrich. So that is strategy we have been using for the DHA or omega-3 fatty acid already. So we might, we haven't checked that yet, but it can be possible. Yeah, it might just be an added benefit, I guess, huh? But, du but during those challenge period, I think the board might have used those for their own physiological need rather than putting them into the eggs. Yeah, there's the requirement's just that much higher that to be able to fight off that infection, right? Yeah. 
so you've, you have been at uh, Cornell University for almost a year now, and you're doing a postdoc, right? It's all at Abina, yeah. Doing, <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you. And working on similar work. So over here, we are working a little bit different. So right now, I'm working more in a broiler uh, rather than in a laying hands, but in a disease bottle again. So over here, we are trying to upcycle the waste from the grape and wine and juice industry, uh, which is grape pomace, which is rich in polyphenol, bioactive compounds that we haven't think of using it in the poultry yet. So we are trying to find out like if it's possible or not. That sounds like a it's a great way to be able to kind of recycle some of these you know waste and find alternative uses for them, um, and I can I can help with uh, at least helping to get that alternative waste going. <laughs> yeah, definitely, we can always collaborate on these kind of things, and then we already did like few. Uh, challenge with a disease in a disease model like uh, in an inflam intestinal uh, model and then in a coccidiosis challenge model and then on both approach we have like a little bit of similar and different approach for the inflam gut model we uh, fed the chickens with 0.5 percent of the grape pomace also we fermented those with the probiotic fungi and bacteria to see if they will increase and then the intestinal microbiome and then have like even more positive effect on it. And then we have seen those, especially with the gut microbiome and then their metabolites, we have seen really promising effect with the grape pomace and then the fermented grape pomace in our inflamed challenge model. And then, wow. all, of course, they also improve the uh, body weight and then the performance parameter for sure, even in the inflamed model. What level is this pomace, um, pomace at in, I guess, to, if if somebody's interested in either utilizing it from a commercial standpoint or utilizing it for research, is it something that's widely available at this point or is just kind of still getting feet wet to see kind of how um, beneficial it may be to go into the market as a potential solution? In the New York state alone, there are like millions of tons of grape pomace that are like, uh, is, that are sitting outside as a waste and then even in waste like California, which is the largest wine producing uh, state in the United States. So I think if we get like further research into it, deep dive into it, how can we process this even to have like uh, more polyphenol and then less of a fiber because grape pomace itself is skin seed and then place of the grapes after the wine or juice is pressed out of it. So there is still like some how much we need to integrate in the feed, how much we need. So those are still like need to be understand, but there is a great potential out there with the great pomace. Well, so um, the first, uh, the layer work that you were talking about, that's available, um, newly published, right? And so where, where are we at with the, um, with the broiler work with great pomace? Uh, with the great pomace that we use with the challenge model with the coccidiosis, it is under review, so we might be able to get it done by the end of the year or by even like we already received the review. So we just have to like address it and then send it back to the poultry science. So maybe available within like a couple of months as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And the other one with the fermented grape pomace, we are working on it. We are waiting waiting for some of the um, microbiome data. And then we are also trying to correlate and then uh, see the microbiome with the performance parameter and how they are like correlated to each other. So it might take a while, but it is still under uh, process. I appreciate you, you know, visiting with us today and telling us about all this new work that you've been doing. And it was really awesome to catch up with you today, Milan. Thank you so much. Same here, Dr. Wamsi. It's nice to see you. And then we'll see you at PSA. Oh, yeah. Well, well thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll have to, I would love to try to find a time that we could chat a little bit more and maybe talk about some of the work that you're seeing in the how these uh, different feed additives that you're looking at can affect the microbiome too. Um, and, then, and then how that plays into uh, you know, the bird's response into coccidiosis. So let's, let's try to plan something like that, okay? Yep, see you later, Wamsley. Okay, awesome, thanks. And so this is uh, Kelly Wamsley, joined by Dr. Milan Sharma in another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Thanks for joining us today, bye.